Welcome back, everyone, and uh, thanks for being on time. We're going to start to look, uh, looking forward to the future now and how the industry is moving from sick care to health care. Dr. Kunkas has over 25 years of experience in the health and biomedical sciences. His aim is to make healthcare more personalized, predictive, participatory, and ultimately preventive. He is founder of InBio Veritas, founding partner at Advance Healthcare, and partner at Health Startup. Please join me in welcoming Kunkas. Good morning. I would like to start with congratulating UPS on the way they handled our luggage in the hotel this morning. It's an extreme form of customer delight. Yeah? And that kind of delight I'm going to try to introduce in healthcare as well today. So in order to take you into the future, we first have to go back in time. We have to go back in time to some parts of China where the doctor was paid as long as the people in the village remained healthy. And once you got sick, you no longer had to pay. What a cool incentive towards outcome-based medicine. How much better can it be? Yeah? And we have lost that big time. For every $100 Euro yen we spend on, I don't call it healthcare, I call it sick care, we give 90 euros to the last two years of our life and less than a euro to prevention. That's crazy. And that's what we're going to change. Maybe slowly, initially, we're going to show you that you can make a business which is much larger by looking into prediction and prevention. Now, we heard that we all are going to age. Huh? And there is one certainty, to be honest. We are going to die, which is fantastic, which, which gives you something to strive for. Now, the key reason to die is because we get chronic diseases. Huh? And the good thing about chronic diseases is that they have something like 15 to 20 years before they manifest when you see a doctor to start playing to prevent that they get to end stage. And let me try to illustrate it with this. Imagine I sell you a watch which tells you how many days you still have to live. Who's interested? No one. But imagine you can buy this one, a watch where you can stop the time or can increase the time by doing something in your environment, in your lifestyle. That's my point. We all would like to sign up to be healthy the day before we die. Even if it's 85 or 93 or 101, I don't care. But the day before I die, I still want to be healthy. That's what we're going to try to, be, to sign up for. Now, why did we lose this model from, 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 from old China? I couldn't do it better than explaining it by a quote from Moliere. And Moliere once said, doctors, they use drugs they know little about, they buy them from pharma companies, to treat disease they even know less in patients they know nothing about. With all respect, your doctor knows nothing about you. Let me illustrate that. If I send a package with UPS from Madrid to Tokyo, I can go to a website and I can trace the package every single second. And I find that normal. That's to your credit. Huh? But a average chronic patient is 8,700 hours by himself or herself, not connected to healthcare. So a UPS package is better off than me as a patient. That's not normal. And that's what we're going to change. We're going to change that by introducing three guardian angels. One, maybe initially far away from you, your biology, your genetic code. Two, wearables, sensors. And we're going to link them to the internet, basically trying to change behavior. So this is not about technology. This is about behavior, delight, and making healthcare attractive. OK. You know that one. Huh? That's the, the, the big mainframe computer 60 years ago, which basically required half the room which we're sitting. And all the guys sitting in front of the mainframe, sorry ladies, it was always a guy, they felt themselves as the god of computing. Every single calculation in the company had to pass via this device. And at the time that the personal computer started to enter the market, all the guys at the upper part said, well, oh, that's a joke. A personal computer, not powerful, not accurate, no memory at all, it's just good enough to play with. But you know what happens when something which is out of reach for the consumer becomes accessible to play with? 
you take this to your attic, you take this to your uh, cellar, and you build something like Microsoft, you build something like Facebook. This is your hospital. The lower part is your doctor. You know what came next. After the personal computer, something like the smartphone came with just a few little apps. That is the change we're going to see as well. From big mainframe out of reach to accessible to me as a patient, as a consumer, all time. And that's what I'm going to try to explain. So starting with the first guard, the angel, your personal genome. Just to put that in perspective, three billion digits. 99% of us is identical. Two eyes, ten fingers, one heart. Only 0.1% makes us different. We are different from monkeys for 2%, well, some people less. And three billion, just to put that in perspective, that's ten times an Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, this year, the first device came to market. The size of this thing, which allows me to sequence my genome basically as a toy, not perfectly accurate yet, but doing that at home, basically in the same fashion as the smartphone was next to the big mainframe computer. It comes from an Oxford company called Oxford Nanopore. So what is it that is it going to do? Well, let me give you first this example. A few years ago, the state of Hawaii sued two of the big pharma companies because these two companies, they brought a, a blood thinner to the market in North America, the very same way they did in Hawaii. Now, people in Hawaii, they differ from all the rest in North America in three digits, basically three out of three billion, which they have derived from Southeast Asia. So people in Hawaii said, well, look, you have to adapt your prescription to our biology because we metabolize these products faster. And therefore, you have to bring us a little bit a different drug or at least a different prescription. And the state of Hawaii won. So imagine you are going to do that. You, based on your biology, request a pharma company to adapt the drug to your profile. How on earth are we going to deal with that? Well, this might be one solution towards doing that. This is the first FDA-approved 3D printed pill, which is a pill to treat epilepsy. The drug was off patent. It's a piece of software which I send to a printer and I print basically at home or at my pharmacy. So imagine that we're going to do that for all the drugs, where we simply adapt the dose based on my metabolism. We concentrate a little bit more, we concentrate a little bit less. You might argue we are not going to do that. Well, the company which was disrupted by this didn't see this come. They thought it was science fiction. Currently, we are building printers, not with color cartridges, but with cartridges with different chemistries in, so that you can print all the pills I need as a chronic patient at home. So that's the end stage supply chain, I would argue. Yeah? But then you might say, well, that's not sick, that's not healthcare, that's still sick care. Yeah? So if I would offer you access to your genetic code when you leave the building, who would like to have access to that? Phew, that's not a lot of people. Yeah? If I ask my students, one in five says yes, four in five say, I don't want to know because of this. What if I find out that I might be predisposed to something Angelina was predisposed to and have to decide to remove my two breasts? That's not a decision easy to take. But then I tell people, this is in development. These are the first sensors which sit at the inside of my bra, well, Angelina's bra, sit on my breast, and measure one thousandth of a degree Celsius difference. So once a tumor starts to grow in my breast, the sensor knows. And only then I do have to decide. One in five of my students becomes three in five. Because the decision I have to make is linked to a sensor which tells me now it's needed. I'm predisposed, yes, but I don't have to make the decision now. I do it when it's needed. The equivalent from men, if I ask, well, can I look to the chance, the fact that you're predisposed to colon cancer, people say, well, oh, no, 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 no. I don't even want to think about it because you're going to put something like this in the back of my body. That's not even what I want to think. Well, we don't do that any longer. We have smart, tiny pills now, like this. Eh? This size is like Asimov, which we digest, 
which film everything which is inside, which is kind of reused after sterilization. One in five becomes four in five. The world changes because technology allows me to make a decision in a different fashion. So let me take that to the next level. Last year, we lost two promising football players in Belgium because their heart suddenly stopped beating while playing football. Well, that's absolutely crazy. We know the genes which predispose. We can screen people for that. Now, you say, well, that's hard to do, because what do you do when you are predisposed? Well, we simply implant a wearable defibrillator. I'm predisposed, something happens, and it turns on, and the world moves on. That's preventive, predictive care, which prevents me even from dying, that I become an end-stage patient. So awaiting this, what you should expect from your cardiologist is minimal this. Your cardiologist is going to send you home after a checkup, let's say with an appointment, the 1st of December. But what if your cardiologist sends you home with a small case around your smartphone? This one, FDA approved, a life core. It's a small case on which I put my fingers for 10 seconds a day. It basically analyzes my complete heart function, stores it in the cloud, and when it's off baseline, my nurse, my cardiologist, calls me and says, Kuhn, we're not going to wait till the 1st of December. I want to see you next week in time, and we're going to tweak you something. Which cardiologist do you pick? And that is the reason why you have to pay attention to these gadgets. Because these gadgets in the next generation will have heart monitors, which will have the same, not always clinical grade, but the same power as what these things do. This is a graph from a next generation watch. The black one is what the, heart, the Apple Watch does. The red one is what I do in the clinic with a clinical grade monitor. It's spot on, but it's always there. I always have access to that. And that brings me with, to the first kind of guardian angel where biology starts to allow me to initially play with a predisposition in a completely different fashion than that I have to decide on something. I don't know whether it's even actionable. Now you might argue, well, phew, that stuff, if that is what we're going to do, mm, might take some time. So this is the first thing you have to remember. Your health is the combination of your biology, which you got from your parents, your lifestyle, and your environment. And let's say we don't touch genomes yet, and we're going to play with the two other things. How can that bring us kind of delight in the system? This is the red light district in Amsterdam. Yeah? In the English version, you have the first fully automated pop-up clinic, which measures for sexually transmitted disease in 15 minutes on the fly. So when I leave here, before going home, I go here first. So healthcare comes to the place where I need it. It's predictive care. It's there, and I'm happy to use it. It looks nice. Yeah? Eh? Yeah? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so that brings me to closer to your home, closer to your heart. A few years ago, you start to see the first kind of stupid plastic gadgets entering the market, wearables, eh? which nowadays have something like 100 variations, which do basic things. Not always accurate, but basic things like measuring my number of steps. How basic can it get? Well, one of the first generations of these, the Nike band, had a single kind of number of LEDs, which you could program to do, let's say, 5,000 steps. And only when you did 5,000 steps a day, red turned into orange, turned into green. So when I was testing these things, what's very frequent four years ago, I came home. And the first thing my kid said was, was not that, how was it at, at work? They looked to the, to the device and said, well, come on, it's still in red. You even didn't manage to move. You've been sitting behind your computer all the time. That's not nice. That's social pressure from your kids. But that's interesting, because you can link social behavior to something I even didn't realize I didn't do, which is moving relevantly. Yeah. Now, for the women here, you might say, well, I'm not going to use this. Did I do something wrong? I'm not going to use it because it doesn't look nice. Well, this is Swarovski. I should do it like this. This is Swarovski entering the market with a jewel with small devices in it which measure six out of these seven parameters. Sexy. It looks nice. That's something I dare to wear. Yeah? Or this one. If I tell my children don't eat too fast, they say, well, what is not eating too fast? 
This is the first kind of knife and fork, which measures my serving time. And when it goes too fast, it shakes. My kids loved it. Yeah? Or this one. Every single measurement your doctor currently performs in his office, between now and two years from now, you will be able to do it at home. At home. At your service. Even measuring your cervical pap smear. Yeah? And that brings me to this, because that's what is it going to allow. If you are a pain patient, or you are kind of a sleeping problem um, uh, sufferer, what you are really looking for is the reason why you don't sleep, why you're sometimes in pain. So imagine you have this app on your smartphone, where you can indicate where the pain started. It started somewhere here, where you can measure some of your basic activities. I did so much exercise. I have been sleeping so much. I've been drinking so much caffeine, so much whatever, alcohol. And after one week, that thing tells me, Kuhn, your migraine starts each time on Monday. When you came back from London on Friday, slept longer than till 9 on Saturday, did more than two liters of coffee on Sunday, and did less than 6,000 steps on Monday. That is delight. No one will ever tell me. My tiny computer, my wearables, my sensors sitting in my smartphone will be able to do that. My doctor loves this. Why does he love it? Because all of a sudden, he has something to be closer to the patient. Currently, we have 40 clinical trials ongoing where people get a Fitbit, a simple device to measure whether I'm fit enough to even benefit from my drug. Yeah? This is a box which we provide to patients in hospitals in Belgium. It contains six devices to measure. And patients embrace it because they feel that all of a sudden the doctor comes home. He gives them tools to understand why it is that sometimes they get sick. And it goes in different directions. These are the first socks, which do measure a pressure loss in my, my feet as a predictor to diabetic ulcers. It's predictive, even preventive care. Or this one. One of the biggest challenges we have is to remind people to drink enough which you might hardly believe, but at some age, we start to tend to forget to drink. Now imagine, and by the way, a few years ago, we lost 6,000 French women in a hot summer. So imagine, and this is something we do with a, with a, with a, with a, um, a, a Japanese company, you can put a patch on me which measures dehydration. Not good enough, because if I forget to drink, well, maybe I cannot even interpret the patch. But technology allows me now to insert a small layer of electronics into the patch. And being 80 years old, I watch a lot of TV. So you hear me coming. Every two hours, my TV tells me, couldn't go drinking. And that's what I like. Biology, linked with the sensor, linked with the Internet of Things, changes my behavior. This is something we do with the bottle, um, with, the, with, the, with the water brand, which makes screw caps which you can 3D print. So you have a bottle on the table, and you can program that the sensor measures dehydration, bloops, and the flag comes out. That's the light. I don't have to think about healthcare. It's invisible. It's there to me to embrace and to enjoy. And this is the second thing you have to remember. Two years ago, 6,000 diabetic patients were sent home with the same drug and with one single, very accurate step counter. Half of the patients, which did an extra 3,000 steps a day, were still free from extra comorbidities of the heart two years later. This was published in The Lancet. This was the first evidence that indeed sitting is the new smoking. That simply providing people the motivation to exercise increases the quality of drugs, increases the quality of life big time. But how to motivate this? Well, maybe this is over the top. This is a wearable which gives me a little shock when I don't move enough. Maybe you're not going to do that. It exists, by the way. Eh? Or this one, maybe better. This is Nike, playing with vending machines in New York. And each time I did my X thousand steps, I can get something for free out of the vending machine. Closer. But this is even cooler. This is the Alpha Bank in Russia. The Alpha Bank in Russia gives me a higher interest on my bank account if I do 10,000 steps a day. Is that altruism? No way. Altruism is the extreme form of egoism. They know what I told you in the first slide. I'm going to live longer if I live healthy. The business model from getting me as a healthy consumer, you see the point. 
By the way, in the States, we have the first insurance companies which pay me cash to remain healthy. The state of Dubai gives me one gram of gold for every two kilograms I lose due to exercise because they know the equation at the end. Or this one is a cool one as well. This was initially launched at the Olympics in Moscow during the, um, the summer, the, the winter Olympics. I got a free ride on the metro if I went to my knees 30 times in two minutes. The state of Mexico is currently rolling that out in the entire country. Every ride is free if I move, exercise for two minutes in front of the vending machine. How cool is that? The business model is completely turning upside down. And by the way, you all had kids which did do Pokemon. That was just the beginning of what becomes possible. But see, on the launch of Pokemon, basically the world moved twice as much as before. Yeah? Okay. Now, you still might argue, well, phew, how is that going to come to me? Eh? And if you look to UPS, which I think is, is aiming for instant gratification, eh? I need a package now, could we do that in healthcare as well? Can the package, can health come home in a convenient fashion? I think it is. These are the first examples of tools where basically I interact with my doctor on my mobile device, and not just book my appointments, but basically book all the drugs which I might need, all the events I might need in the, in the, um, in the cause of my disease, all at the tip of one single finger. Is that solving everything? Hell no. Because um, a number of things are things which seem to be more complex than just letting people move. So look at this. This is one of the first experiments we do with people which are chronic pain patients. If you walk out of the building and you swap your ankle, it gets stick, and you would like to have a fridge with a cold pack to put it on your ankle. Chronic pain patients are benefiting from a virtual reality glass in which we put them in a snow landscape and we start to throw snowballs on them. And the feeling of the snowball induces an intense of cold which reduces the pain. That's Digital Health 2016. I want my clinician to prescribe me a glass if needed. Yeah? Or this one. I don't have time to show it uh, um, uh, as a demo, but write it down. This is one of the ultimate forms of supply chain management. This is Dr. Saxon hologram. Type that down later on tonight. With two beamers, you can present my doctor as a hologram here on stage. How cool would it be if that sits in the portfolio of UPS? Yeah? And is that solving everything? No. Some patients do require help to deal with compliance adherence. These are the first pills, which do contain a very tiny sensor, which basically, when I take the pill in my, in my, via my um, uh, um, uh, 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 digestive tract, when it enters my stomach, my stomach acid releases the sensor in the pill. And it sends a very weak message, a signal to a patch on my arm, and the patch sends a text message to my son, Daddy took his medication, or not, quarter past three. That's the light. I don't even have to think about this any longer. Developed by a Swiss company and currently tested in two clinical trials. Or this one, this is the first company which in the US, I believe, managed to bring Unipax at home. Some people do require six drugs at eight, 12 drugs at nine, or at three, and so on. These people, they bring one single package with a BMS, a Sanofi, or whatever drug, into the package to my door, physically to my door, at eight, at three, and at eight at night. And this way, you have to realize that we start to see the first apps entering the market, which are not just apps reimbursed to manage my disease, diabetes was the first one, but last month, the first app entered the market, which helps me in preventing disease, completely reimbursed. Healthcare really comes home, just like my dentist comes home, just like my ophthalmologist, my eye doctor comes home. And if you think about the future, how cool would it be that in a supply chain, that drug development, which is linked to, well, doing phase three and four trials, is linked to an app 
like the one from Apple or the one from Google, where you integrate your drug discovery and clinical trials directly in something like ResearchKit open, tailored to your uh, company and linked to your supply chain manufacturing. And that brings me be with mobility again. Four of the biggest car companies are investing big time in healthcare. We spent hours in the car. Well, why not using my steering wheel to look to biomarkers which tell me that maybe I'm stressed so that my car can tell me you have a meeting at 11, <sighs> cool down, relax, take a breath. Predictive, preventive care. Audi does it, Mercedes does it, LG does it. Yeah? And then I hear a number of people think, well, whew, how are we going to deal with all the data from all these devices and the ethics and the privacy around that? Yeah? So let me ask you a question. Who is willing to tell me where he or she will be Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon? <laughs> Not a lot of people. It's none of my business, you might argue. Yeah? But let me show you this. Who has been to Disneyland? the last year and a half in the States, by any chance. Yeah, you might recognize this. Before you go to Disneyland, you get a box at home with magic bands. Your name, the name of your partner, the name of your kids. And the first thing you do, it's a product, eh? you pass the park, you don't have to pay. It goes automatically. Well, that's standard. But you know what I hate in Disneyland? That's waiting 45 minutes in line before Space Mountain with my kids. Not nice. But all of a sudden, this band tells me, Kuhn, if you live now here to Space Mountain, there is no line. Wow, that's a service. I'm willing to give up exactly where I am at 3 o'clock to get that service back. So if I get something in return, I'm happy to give my data. Yeah? But you know why we went to Disneyland? Because my wife, that's my wife's birthday. And we end the Disneyland, and the first thing she gets is flowers. How cool is that? Is Disneyland selling flowers? No. Is Disneyland dealing with a company which sells flowers? Yes. So all of a sudden, a product becomes a service, becomes an experience where we can learn from big time in healthcare to really follow the very same model. And this might be a picture of that future. My doctor, which tells me, well, I remind you to put some cream on, or you've been walking with your dog in a forest where flowers are blossoming, you're allergic to, your, home, your dog is full of seeds of these flowers. Please wash your dog. How cool would that be? My doctor becomes my coach, always present to predict and prevent. And sometimes he will not be able to do. This is the biggest social network for drug side effects. It's Facebook for drug side effects. There is more insights at this site about your drugs than at the FDA. Big time, insightful to learn what your patient does while he's taking your drug and why sometimes it doesn't benefit to make it more personalized. So to summarize what you've heard so far, I think that the future of healthcare is going to resemble big time, big hero six. Did you want to see the movie? Nice movie, yeah? Five friends which learned to know a sixth one, a big inflatable marshmallow Doctor, Baymax, this one, which sits in my room, is there, and helps me now and then. Not perfect yet, because this cognitive system is not perfect yet, but he's there to remind me to prevent, to predict, and to make things more personalized. Where we're going to combine biology with sensors, with the internet, like the examples I gave, which generate thing, wordless big data, but this data are going to allow machines to become more intelligent, are going to steer devices, my TV is a device, my bottle is a device, to change action, to change behavior in a completely invisible fashion. Now, we heard it from Jan earlier this morning. The key thing, the absolute key requirement to make this happen is this. Are we going to build a system based on the trust? You know what the biggest hotel brand is on the planet? So, yeah. So it's not Accor, it's not Marriott, it's not Holiday Inn, it's Airbnb. Eh? It's a website. Basically, where I put my room on for you to basically rent if I'm out of my country. That's this. Eh? 
I have the keys of your house, I'm gonna sleep in your bed. Pretty freaky. And out of one million interactions, it went wrong three times. Well, not with me in general, yeah? Same with Uber. But look at this, this is the website of Airbnb. You see a city, here you see, well, all the rooms you can rent, the B&Bs, and then you have a glider with the price, and that's how it looks. I'm sure a lot of you have used it. Look to this, this is San Francisco. Blue is hotels in San Francisco. You know what it is? B&Bs in San Francisco. Once a upper layer of a sharing network becomes available, all of a sudden, in this case, hotels become available for all of us at any point in time, everywhere. This is the first healthcare equivalent of Airbnb, it's Cohilo. Cohilo allows me to rent a scanner, a medical device with Cohilo. I don't want to wait one week till I get into my local hospital. I book my room there and they book me somewhere else. That's the same kind of delight I get from an Airbnb of an Uber taxi. And I have two minutes to go. And this is going to lead or going to help by reputation management. If you book a room, you go to booking.com or Triviago, and you look to ratings from other people. But you haven't looked yet, for sure not in Europe, to ratings for your doctor and your hospital. So what if you can pick a doctor, one guy pre prescribes a pill, which might work. And the other one prescribes a step counter, a virtual reality glass, and an app. Which doctor are you gonna pick? A dust and a bet, the second one. And that brings me to my last slide. These are the plans for a completely new hospital in Tunis. 90% of beds are preventive care beds. It's not about beds, it's about providing people the tools to learn what they can do to remain healthy themselves. If such a hospital has to team up with something, make sure it's your pharma company, company X Insights, make sure it's your supply chain company, supply chain company Insights. And with that, I would like to stop and leave you with this. I think we have all the tools ready to start moving from, yes, making medicine more precise to ultimately making medicine more personalized, really personalized. And this is not about technology. This is about thinking about these things. Make something invisible, make something delightful, make something where I feel enhanced, and make it at least attractive. And I hope this has generated at least a few ideas to take forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kuhn, um, for these, uh, for these, uh, for all these insights that you shared.